All right, this is the start of section 8.2. We're talking about confidence intervals for a proportion, in which case we will use our sample proportion, p hat, to make an estimate for the true population proportion, p. So to construct this confidence interval, uh, there are three conditions. The first one that we'll talk about down here at the bottom would be the independence condition, which we know to be uh, otherwise the 10% condition which means when we're sampling without replacement, our sample size can't take up more than 10% of the population size. So that means we'll have independence among our sample, and for us, that verifies the standard deviation formula. Going up here to my next bullet point, we have a normality condition, which we've seen before as the large counts condition. So in this case, we're not going to know what the true p is, but we will have our sample p hat. So to check this, we're just going to check n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat, both being at least 10. Or as I like to say, you have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. And then the final condition would just be uh, the randomness component to our sampling. So the data come from an SRS or a randomized experiment. And the reason we check and verify all three of these, well, for normality, it confirms the shape of our sampling distribution. For the independence condition, well, standard deviation refers to the spread. And then the randomness ensures that our center is unbiased. And so what do we do if one of these conditions is violated? Um, we'll simply just note that and say proceed with caution and move on with the rest of the problem. And so the next part here says, what's the difference between the standard deviation of a statistic and the standard error of a statistic? So uh, in Chapter 7, we learned the standard deviation for a sampling distribution to just be p, 1 minus p over n, and then the square root. So when we're doing actual inference, we wouldn't know what the true value of p was, or else there'd be no inference to do. So the standard error formula, se of p hat, is the same formula with our best guess for what p is, which is p hat. So now that we're doing actual inference in chapter 8, we'll have to use the standard error of p hat, and then when we use this formula, Instead of p, we'll just use the p hat. So we would use this one in chapter 7, right? The standard deviation formula for when the true p is actually known. And then for when p is unknown, right, we'll use this formula. In other words, this formula is used for estimating what p is using p hat. So is this standard error formula on the formula sheet? Turns out it actually is now on the new AP formula sheet. Uh, and it looks the same except for instead of capital SE for standard error, it just has lowercase s with a p hat subscript. So this is how it appears on our formula sheet. And then how exactly would you interpret this value? So in green here, um, the standard error of p hat describes how close the sample proportion p hat, how close the sample proportion p hat will typically be from the true population proportion p. And since we're talking about uh, the sampling distribution approach, right, and that would be from many repeated samples of the same size. So how close our sample proportion p hat will typically be to the true population proportion P and repeated SRSs of the same size N. Scrolling down here, the next part says, so what's a critical value? How's it calculated and what's up with the little star? So the general idea for a confidence interval is based on this point estimate plus minus the margin of error, 
More specifically on the formula sheet, that's our statistic, whether it's x bar or p hat, plus or minus our critical value times the standard error of a statistic, which we just referred to. So then specific to proportions, how does each, each piece sort of fall out here? The statistic that we'll use, our point estimate, is p hat. That's our best guess for what the true p is. Plus or minus a critical value. This will be a z score. So that's z star, our critical value, which essentially is going to refer to how many standard deviations above and below we'd like to go. So that critical value is our z star. And then our standard error formula, which is what we just talked about in the previous section. So our point estimate, or our statistic, is p hat, just to color code these. And then our standard error for the statistic, we have the square root formula with the p hats. And the entire plus minus piece represents our margin of error. So back to the critical value, that z star, that measures how many standard errors we need to extend our interval above or below to reach our desired confidence level. So if our z-score, our z-star was 2, for example, that would be plus or minus 2 standard deviations, or 2 standard errors, if you will. And so how is it calculated, and what's up with the star? Well, the star means that it's not part of the sample data. It's its own unique thing. So this z-critical value doesn't come from the sample data like all the other components do like the P hat and the N. We just want to use either inverse norm or the Z table to look up how many standard errors we'd like based on our confidence level. And so the first example here says, what's the critical value for a 96% confidence interval for a proportion? So in other words, what's the z-star from a standard normal distribution? So we can either look at the chart or use inverse norm. Um, and just to illustrate this, this is really important. Since the curve is perfectly symmetric, that 96% should represent the shaded area in the middle. So, so we've got this symmetry here. We really care about what these boundaries are at. So there's 4% left to split up into the tails, meaning there's 2% here and 2% left here. So this would be at the second percentile, 2%, and this would be at the 98th percentile. And we know that because if 96% is in the middle, 4% would be left to split up between the two tails. So we need to either look up the z-score that goes with either 2% or 98%, or we can use our calculator in the inverse norm command and either use 98% for that boundary or 2% for that boundary. Either way, you'll get the same answer one will be positive, one will be negative. So our default area is 0.98, the mean is 0, the standard deviation is 1 for the standard normal distribution, should give us 2.05 for our critical value. And all that means is to capture that inner 96% in a standard normal distribution, we go 2.05 standard deviations above and below the mean. So that would be the z-score at each one of these boundaries. So the next part here says, what is the formula for a one-sample z-interval for a proportion? I want to make a note here. A one-sample z-interval for a proportion, that's really the formal name of this confidence interval. And we'll see other formal names for means and different types of intervals as we go along. Uh, the formula is actually not on the formula sheet, and we've already gone through it here once. Uh, it's p hat, our point estimate, plus or minus our critical value times the standard error of our statistics. So that is the actual formula. However, it's not on the formula sheet. And one important thing to note here is we can see all three conditions present within this expression. 
So I've kind of got I kind of got it color coded here. Uh, the independence or the 10% condition, right? That's what verifies our standard deviation formula. So that verifies the spread. The Z star, uh, well, that comes from a normal distribution if we use the inverse norm command. So that refers to the large counts condition. And then the only other condition we have that's met uh, is the randomness condition. So that means that our distribution is unbiased right, and centered where it's supposed to be. So we have the shape, center, and spread all present within this expression. Alright, the final example for these notes. It says, students in an AP stats class want to estimate the proportion of pennies in circulation that are more than 10 years old. To do this, they gathered all the pennies they had in their pockets and purses. Overall, 57 out of the 102 pennies they have are more than 10 years old. Let's address part A first, which says, identify the population and the parameter of interest. So it looks like they're trying to gain an inference about a larger population being all the pennies currently in circulation. Which would indeed be a rather large population. And then the parameter they're interested in, you can actually uh, read it right from the question, would be the proportion of all pennies in circulation that are at least 10 years old. So. The parameter would be P, the true population proportion of pennies over 10 years old. So we've got our population, we've got our parameter of interest. Uh, part B says to check the conditions for calculating a confidence interval for the parameter. So we know we've got three conditions, random, independence and normality. Those are the three things we need to verify. Uh, for starters, well, it says the data were not obtained randomly. They just grabbed the stuff out of their pockets and purses. So that condition looks like we can't really trust. We could try to assume that their personal collection of pennies represent a random sample, but in general, uh, they weren't randomly obtained from that larger population that we specified. For independence, we should be pretty safe. They've only got 102 pennies in their sample, uh, and that's far less than 10% of the population size of all pennies in circulation. So we should be pretty safe there for the 10% condition. So we can say the 10% condition is met and give it a check mark. And then for normality, proportions, we need the large counts condition. And we don't know what P is, so we're going to do our best and prove this with P hat. So we need N times P hat and N times 1 minus P hat to both be at least 10. So P hat would be the 57 out of 102 pennies that were old. So N times P hat is just 57 successes in this case. And N times 1 minus P hat would be the other 45 out of 102 pennies, so 45 failures in this case, both of which are at least 10. So that condition is met. We can assume normality. So it looks like we've got two out of our three conditions being met, the random one failing at the moment. So we would just note to say proceed with caution from here. All right, so proceeding on with caution, let's go to part C, where we need to actually construct a 99% confidence interval for the parameter. So let's start with our p hat, which was 57 out of 102, or as a decimal, 0.559. So we'll do our p hat, plus or minus. For now, we'll just leave these two parts blank. This one we can fill in right away because we know it's the square root of p hat 1 minus p hat over n. We just need to do a little bit of work to figure out what that z star would be, our critical value. 
and I want to caution you, don't just use inverse norm and 0.99 as your area. So if we think about the standard normal distribution, it's perfectly symmetric. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we shade the inner 99%, what are those boundary markers at? I'll give you a hint. It's not 0.99. So we know we've got 1% left to split up evenly between the tails, which means this would be at 0 0.005, and this boundary would be at 0.995. So those are the values that you should be able to use for either the inverse norm command or if you'd like to look it up on the normal Z table. So <clears throat> I'm going to use inverse norm, and I'll go ahead and use the 0 0.995 boundary for my area then the default would be 0 and 1, which gives me a z-score of 2.56. And again, since this is perfectly symmetric, that means 2.56 would be the z-score at this boundary, and negative 2.56 would be the z-score at this boundary. Okay, so I've got my z-star, my critical value. Now I'm ready to go ahead and crunch this interval. I'm going to start with just getting the margin of error here. So if I multiply the critical value times the standard error, I get 0.12585 as my margin of error. So now I'm just going to add and subtract from 0.559 to get my interval, 0.433 up to 0.685. And now it's time for part D, which says interpret the interval in context. So this is something I hope my students have this cookie cutter approach, nail it every time. We can sort of just fill in the blanks here. We, we know we are 99% confident that the interval from blank to blank, so let's fill in the lower bound and upper bound here, 0.433 to 0.685 captures the true population proportion, and let's get the context right, of all pennies in circulation over 10 years old. So I hope my students have that nailed down by now. If not, I'm sure they will. We are 99% confident that the interval from blank to blank captures the true population blank. And let's just fill in the context from the problem. All right, and then I need to make some room here for part E which says, is it plausible that more than 60% of all pennies in circulation are more than 10 years old? So at the end of the day, this interval that we made just represents an interval of plausible values for P, right? We made a 99% confidence interval. This interval is just an interval of plausible values. So when you ask me, is it plausible that more than 60%, well, I'm, 0.6 is certainly on this interval. Right? And there's numbers even greater than 0.6 on this interval. So that's the key here. Is 0.6 on this interval or not? And it turns out it is. So for part E, we could say, yes, it's certainly plausible. And the reason being, we could say, since our interval contains the value 0.6, as well as values above 0.6, it is certainly plausible that the true value for P is greater than 0.6. All right, so we've talked about what makes a confidence interval for a proportion and all the components that go into that, like the critical value and the standard error of the statistic. That seems like a good place to stop, so that's all for these notes. I'll see you in class.